what you have given to us, Father, through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus, is more sometimes than we can even begin to express. Great is your faithfulness to us. May we recognize today your faithfulness to us. May somehow, Father, you speak to us in this service. With this gathering of this flock that have come together today, these your people, the sheep of your pasture. Father, may we take something real and alive home with us today, that we can share it with others, that they might see that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords in our lives. Pardon for sin. Lord, you've answered so many prayers as we go down through the prayer list and we look how you've taken care and watched over and healed. What a blessing it is to serve a God who cares so much about us. Would you this morning, Father, minister in children's church especially? Would you minister, Father, in the nursery? But as, as we stand here together in your presence in this sanctuary, may that be what this is this morning for each and every one of us. A place where we can come and we can forget about the pressures of the job, about the pressures of school, about the pressures of health and finances. And just concentrate on your goodness to us. As we think about and sing that last stanza one more time, pardon for sin.
so you're going to be here for a while. But as I reread re it and looked over it, I, I, I got to thinking about something that happened to me, learn, and, learn to give and to receive. Years ago, when God led me to Lewistown, Illinois, I took a huge pay cut from the church that I had been in. I took a huge pay cut from the time that I left, I left uh, my job in Rockford, Illinois, until I went to work for Federal Express and they began to build me back up and things were going pretty good. And I took this huge pay cut when I left uh, Morton, Illinois to go to Lewistown. And I mean, it was, it was a significant pay cut. But my wife and I had decided long, long ago that we would always be faithful to God and then tithe. It didn't matter how much we had. We had to, we had to, we just had to tithe. We had to give it to God. So we did. We learned to give. And God took care of us. And I know I've probably told a lot of you or several of you this story. But I hope I never forget the man. Gus Jokish. Gus was a retired farmer. Well into his 80s. I've been to his home, man. He didn't have anything. I, he didn't. He, Frank, he lived with nothing. And I'll never forget the day that I was in the kitchen with my wife. And I heard this meep, meep, irritating honking out in, out in the lot. What in the world? And I looked out in the, in the back lot behind the house. And there's Gus, Gus and his grandson. So I went out and I said, hey, how you doing, Gus? He said, I'm doing great. And he reached out of the car, go, car window to shake my hand. And I reached over to shake his hand. And when I reached over to shake his hand, he turned my hand over like this, and I felt something in it. And I pulled my hand back, and I looked, and there was a $100 bill folded up. And I looked at that and I said, Gus, I can't take this. He said, you can't not take it. <laughs> Learning to give and receive are some of the most important things that we can do in life. Had I not taken that money from Gus, I would have robbed him of a blessing. Had I not taken that money from Gus, I would have robbed my kids of food. You see, giving and taking, receiving, are such important parts of life. And as Christians, we need to learn to give, trust the Lord with all you have, and receive. And when he gives you, whether it's from Gus Yokish, rest his memory, bless his memory. I've got so many stories I could tell you about Gus, it's unbelievable, but wow, what a, what a man he was. You've been standing for quite a while, but that's probably about the only exercise you've gotten all week. Sorry, it's the only exercise I get. At least I can get an amen out of him for something. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word as you open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. If you're using the Pew Bible this morning, it's on page 1158, Ephesians chapter 3. We'll be reading from the New International Version. Ephesians chapter 3 beginning at verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives his name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Father God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. And thank you for these words that speak to our hearts today. In Christ's name.
Probably all of you have heard this statement before in your life. I've heard it for a long time. God does not give us any, God does not give us everything we want, but He always gives us everything we need. Have you ever heard that? <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure you've heard it, and I've heard it, and, and usually I hear it when there's something that, that we wanted that we didn't get. Hmm? We, we really did. We wanted it, we didn't get it, and, and we usually say that. Sometimes it feels like more of a burden than it is a promise. And that's because we Americans, admittedly, I, I'm right here in the middle of it with you. We, we Americans, we really are used to getting whatever it is we want, whenever we want. It seems to me that society is teaching us, and particularly our young people, there's no one but me. I'm the only one. There's nobody but me. If I think it'll make me happy, I want it. Yeah. Oh. But I don't think that that's exactly what the Bible teaches us. I really don't think that's exactly what the Bible teaches us. Society may teach us that. Society will, will tell us that we can have everything that we want. But we're reminded by Paul, and I believe this is very strongly, that God gives us everything we need. And God gives us more than what we need. Look at us. Paul wants us to recognize and experience God's abundance. And remember this. God's abundance does not always come to us in the way that society tells us to expect. But we can trust his supply. That's my first point this morning, that we can trust his supply. How can we say that? Because he's rich? He's rich. God is rich. I mean, he is rich. Look, what he, look at what it says in verse 16. Out of his glorious riches, that he may strengthen you with power. Oh, out of his glorious riches, he's rich. Now, you might think that I'm thinking of massive piles of gold or great oil wells or, or something. That's not what I'm talking about. God's riches are different than that. I know, yes, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And sometimes we think that that's all that we can think about. It's that, that cash on hoof. And Paul had something else in mind, I think. When he says in Ephesians 2, but because of his great love for us, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. You see, there's what we need to be thinking about what God has done for us. It is in his great grace and his mercy. He's rich in mercy, and he pours that mercy on us from Calvary's hill. We celebrated that this morning by taking the bread and the wine and drinking and eating and trusting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. In Ephesians 2, 7, he says, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Grace, grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. He is rich. Oh, he's got all the gold. He owns everything. Nothing that we have belongs to us. It all belongs to him. But the richness that he really has is in grace and mercy. Oh, man. When you think of his grace that he pours out on you and his mercy to pour that grace on you, we need to come to a place that we trust him. Why? Because he loves us. He loves us. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Ask, and ye shall receive. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be open unto you. And here's a prayer for all of us, if we as believers would grasp hold of it. How wide and how long and how deep is the love of Christ? How long, how wide, and how deep. Deep. Love so huge. His love is so huge. Don't we have a little trouble comprehending it? Trying to think of how... I mean, honestly, go back in your life. 
If you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I want you to go back and think about how your life was before you met Christ. What a mess. And in His rich mercy, in His rich grace that He pours out on you, He changed all that. Why did He do that? Why did He do that? Because He loves us. Jesus loves me. For it's in my heart. The Bible tells me, but I've got him in my heart. And God gives us enough. Point number two. See, we're flying right through this message. The dictionary defines satisfaction as fulfillment, gratification, and contentment. You know what I found? Satisfaction is a state of mind. It really is. And we need to work. Listen, listen. I'm, I'm, talking, I'm talking to Terry Vance when I preach this. We need to work on being satisfied. We really do. We really need to work on being satisfied because sometimes uh, we're not satisfied with God's provision. We expect more. We have, real, we have unreal expectations of what He should provide. Think about this. How many people think this? I'm a Christian. I should have good health. I'm a Christian. I should have fine wealth. I'm a Christian. I should have a wonderful home. I'm a Christian. I should have people loving me. Let me tell you, it doesn't always work like that. Some people have terrible health. Some people have no wealth. Some people have poor homes. And some people are just about unlovable. I didn't get an amen. I was thinking I'd get an amen on that one, but I didn't. I don't want you to be disillusioned. I don't. Because if you're expecting God to give you all the wealth and to give you all the, all the health and all of those things, it just may not happen the way you want it to happen. You see, Paul gave his life to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. He gave his life. Some people like to pray, oh God, please give me some status. Oh God, if I get a little education, I'll have some status. Oh God, if I, if I have a, little, a, 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 nice, a nice job, I'll have some public regard. And, oh, I can have all that. But here's what Paul said in Philippians. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to, be, to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I'm satisfied. <clears throat> we can be satisfied. We can be satisfied because He gives us abundant blessings. Now, I'm not sure. I didn't ever meet Him. Some people think I knew Him, but Ben Franklin said this. <laughs> Content makes poor men rich. Discontent makes rich men poor. Go ahead, sing that song to yourself. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below. Opal silver and little gold. I'm not exactly sure how all the blessings are going to come. I don't, I don't know how they're all going to come, but I know this. God is going to bless us. He really is. I, I know. So I want you to do something. There's a song that we used to sing. We're not going to sing it now. I, well, we may not. We might. But there's a song that we used to sing. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. I want you to stop just for a moment. I'm going to take just a second. I, I won't take long. I don't even watch on to time myself this morning, so I, I don't know how long I'll take. But I want you to think about something. Start looking around and counting your blessings. Just for a moment. Think about the blessings. First, start with your salvation. Your sanctification. The church family God's got to give you. Now, let's go from there. What other ways has He blessed you?
you may be thinking, I don't have very many blessings. His grace and mercy should be enough to fill your heart. Amen. His grace and mercy should lift you up. And you should be able to remember that he is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. And what I'm finding is that my Jesus will give me everything I need. He never has failed me. He never has failed me. Now, I know that provision doesn't always come the way we expect it to come or that we want it to come. But it will come. He will provide for us. I don't know if you heard this story or not. You probably have. It's been around for a while. There was an old woman who lived in the neighborhood. She didn't have any money. She was just flat broke. And it was hot summer. Man, she was out of food. She had all her windows open because she couldn't afford to turn on the air conditioner. She had all her windows open. She's down on her knees and she's praying, Oh, God, give me money. Oh, God, give me money. I, I, oh, no, God, I don't need money. I just need some food. That's what I need in the house. I just need some food in the house. Lord, please give me some food. I just want some food in the house. That's all I need, Lord. Just give me some food. And she prayed that morning, noon, and night. She didn't have any food in the house. And she just kept praying, Lord, give me. And really loud. You know how some people can pray really loud? And she prayed really loud. And her neighbor next door was an atheist and just hated anything about God and didn't want to hear anything about it. And he said, I'm going to fix her. So he went out and bought her four bags of groceries. And set them on her front porch, rang the doorbell, and ran off. She opened the front door and she looked out. She saw four bags of groceries. She says, oh! began praying even louder. Thanking Jesus for everything he just provided. Oh, God. And he steps around the corner. He says, ha, ha, gotcha. I gave you those. Oh, no, you didn't. God did that. I just didn't know he's going to use the devil to supply them. <laughs> oh, no, no, what he's going to do. <laughs> My third point, God is faithful. He is faithful. Look back at Genesis chapter 39, verses 20 and 21. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. Do you hear that? In the midst of prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. It didn't matter where he was. He was unjustly accused. He was thrown into prison, and he winds up. And you know what Joseph did? He was thankful. And thankfulness for us is a very important part of who we are and what we do. It's only the beginning. But it should inspire us to be faithful. To be faithful in our giving. To be faithful in our, in our stewardship of our time. And faithful in all the things. He wants us to use our blessings to bless other people. Faithfulness, though, has suffered in our day. Yeah. Do you know faithfulness has suffered in our day? This sanctuary should be full. We should be having two services. But faithfulness has suffered in our day. There are all kinds of stories of unfaithfulness. You know, we hear them every day about the marital betrayals and those kinds of things. And you know, when you think about that, about the unfaithfulness that there is in marriages, the Gallup poll was just released in 2012. 73% of Americans under the age of 45 <clears throat> believe that life spent with the same partner is both unusual and unnecessary. 73% of Americans feel that it's unnecessary to stay with the one that God gave to you in the first place. That just about blew my mind when I read that statistic. But then I read another statistic coming right along with that. Did you know that 89% of those who are involved in divorce and separation, 89% of them said that 
my parents were divorced. When we model unfaithfulness, whether it's in marriage, our church attendance, our giving, or whatever it is, when we model unfaithfulness, do you know what? Others will follow us. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful to God, God's ways. And that person that God gave to you, love them, love them, love them. Think about this. When I think of faithfulness, you know who I think of? My wife. How in the world has she managed for 47 years? I should have got an amen on that one. That woman probably wouldn't have been had it not been for Jesus Christ. She would probably dumped me a long time ago, but she's faithful to God. Amen. And because of His mercy, she's been able to show me mercy. And because of His grace, she's been able to show me grace. Amen. Let me tell you something, folks. We need to be thankful for the grace and mercy that God has poured out on us. And we need to live up to it. And we need to be faithful in what we do, what we say, where we go, how we give, how we attend. We need to model faithfulness. Because modeling faithfulness will influence others. And others will follow us. You know, your faithfulness will help your kids make the right decisions. If you tithe, if you, if you trust God with the tithe, your kids will see that. I can't tithe. I don't have enough money. You can't afford not to tithe. I can't teach Sunday school. I don't have time. Oh, my goodness. Didn't my share a long time ago. Me too. We just need to be faithful. Be a model. Now I know that there's obstacles, and some of the kids, some of the kids this weekend got to go with Miss Jana and and, and, <clears throat> and her mother, and I, I don't know how that happened, but anyway, she took her too. <laughs> and they went to Mid America. Some of the kids have decided that they want to go to Mid America to get their education. What an awesome thought! Having sent kids to Olivet, I didn't send any to Mid America. I graduated from Mid America, but sent my kids to Olivet. Sorry. Amen. <laughs> There's some things that are standing in the way. Finances. Oh man, finances. It's college. It's tough. It's not easy. But those examples. They can get beyond those problems and have a college education and a good Christ, at a good Christian institution. For those of us who have graduated from college and for those of us who have not graduated from college but we're in life, we know that in business there's competition. We know that, we know that in, in uh, uh, work there's competition. But if we put in the hard work, if we put in the effort like the college students are going to have to do, when they do that, if they do that, it won't always be easy. We know that putting in all this hard work isn't always easy, but it is rewarding, and God will be faithful. And if we follow being faithful and doing what we're supposed to do, reading our books and studying and praying and doing those things, God will be faithful. Think about it when Joseph was in prison. Remember when he was in prison? Joseph went in there in Genesis 37 to 50. You might want to read that this week. Joseph made a choice to be faithful. He said, I'm going to be faithful to God no matter what happens to me. And he went on, and he, his brothers didn't like him very much because he was favored, and they threw him in, into a pit, and then they took him out of that pit. They were going to kill him, and they decided to sell him into slavery and get a few bucks for that. So they didn't do that. They didn't kill him. They put him in slavery, and then he went to Potiphar's house, and he was faithful to Potiphar and all those wonderful things. And then that stinking woman, she was. She was a nasty old girl. Yeah. He was faithful to his God. That's right. And he was faithful to his boss. That's right. 
Read the story if you don't remember. He had some stinking old woman accuse him of things that he did not do. And he looked at her when she tempted him. And said this to her. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. Because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? How could he do that? When we're unfaithful, we are unfaithful to others and we're unfaithful to God. Don't be unfaithful with your giving. Don't be unfaithful with your service to God. God is God in temptation and he will be faithful. Remember what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says? You remember it? Should it show up here? Yes, it does. No temptation. Read it with me. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out. Oh, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Temptation comes to every one of us, but we can be faithful. Because He is faithful. I'm going to ask you this morning. What temptations do you face about faithfulness? Thinking about being unfaithful to your spouse? Thinking about being unfaithful to God and not tithing? Thinking about being unfaithful to God and not using your talents for Him? Are you thinking about just quitting? <coughs> what temptations are you taking? Faithfulness, you see, is sticking to your choices. If you're struggling financially, and you made a, a commitment to tithe a long time ago, and you haven't been doing it, maybe you need to go back and start over. There was an old boy in a church I pastored one time, you know, people use excuses not to give their time to the church, not to give their talents to the church or their money to the church. Always using excuses. And you know what an excuse is? An old boy used to tell me this all the time. An excuse is nothing but the skin of a reason stuck with a lie. Think about that. Let that, that, that one sink in. An excuse is nothing more than the skin of a reason stuck with a lie. In the tough times, God is still God. And God has promised He will not abandon you. That's right. Great is His faithfulness. Great is His faithfulness. Morning by morning, the mercies I see. Chris, I didn't ask you to do this, but we're going to do this. Miss Sarah, we're going to sing that first verse of Great is Thy Faithfulness. And then I'm going to dismiss you because I want you to leave this place thinking about His faithfulness. Oh, we might go back down and sing that last verse that says, Pardon for sin. Because it's faithful. Let's go back up and sing that. Can we do that?
have needed, your hands have provided. And Father, they did as you stretched them out, as your son stretched them out on that cross and died for me. I have been provided all I need. Thank you, Jesus, for your love, your mercy, and thank you for the grace that extends far beyond my needs. Bless this, your congregation, and these, your people. Use them, Father, as they take the message of Jesus Christ to others. In his name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We've got guests in here. Find one or two. Shake their hands and tell them you're glad that they're here. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you. Thank you.